If there's one genuine criticism I'd accept of my summary thus far, it's that it detracts from the tone of the book. To which I'd say you're very welcome, Stacy, because the way that tone is conveyed is so crass and incessant it could grind a trench through a six-lane highway. And even if it was handled with more tact, the monofocus on what the main character thinks about with every single line of dialogue takes away focus from much more interesting and important aspects of the best of times. And at worst, clearly puppets the main characters themselves into saying and doing things for the sake of drama. Now what that means in the world outside of my head is stop having a cry at every hint of conflict. You don't have genuine misery in your story just because you lay down and wallow in what little angst you actually care to include. Scenarios aren't destitute just because you make your characters say they are, or because of the things you say they almost do, or the overblown catastrophizing they have to go through to justify it as destitute in the first place. I had so much hope for this book when Asher was thrown into the void, showing that even he, the second most developed character thus far, scarcely past the beginning of the book, wasn't above the humble story arc of sacrificing oneself on a whim for a friend. My good will learned from this swiftly dried up after Stacy began taking every opportunity she could to stab me in the emotional gut, and after the first several times I got horrifically bored and stopped caring about characters' personal issues, which in some way was a mistake. Stacy needed me to care because everything in this book revolves around the characters' personal issues, but more on that later. Act 2 Kincaid relays his plan to the group. Draven is to stay with Morgan and move around one side of the building, while the rest of them escort Kitchen Knife around the other side. As they make their way through, the gremlins instigate an ambush, splitting them before they can split themselves. So I guess Kincaid's plan has just fallen up. Oh. Well, isn't that convenient? Well, I guess the plan is still on then, yeah? No? Morgan comes up with a plan that I'm sure makes sense to someone, involving Draven being bait. So he wanders off and leaves her alone, luring the vast majority of gremlins with him, because... sexism? Meat per pound? Narrative convenience? Morgan climbs up the warehouse shelving and begins her attack against the remaining gremlins. In the fight, she learns that yelling or making loud noise hurts their sensitive ears, and after fighting off the remaining foes, takes off to find Draven armed with this new knowledge. She finds him, and they both get surrounded by gremlins. Idiots. Draven takes this time to ask Morgan what her actual plan was, because it's clearly not going too well. Morgan replies that her plan is to sing. It gets worse. Draven is understandably freaked out by the sheer lack of thought in this idea, but Morgan ignores his valid protests and starts singing. The gremlins closest to them are pacified. Not neutralized by the noise or anything, but stopped in their tracks to listen, because that's apparently how sensitive ears work. Draven joins in with his obviously amazing singing voice, and they all get pacified. It gets worse. The unimportant characters manage their way past the blockage, and they work to toss all the gremlins back through the portal kitchen knife made. Before they leave, Draven rather abruptly confesses to being a siren, which only really exists to highlight how special Morgan is, to remain wholly unaffected by Draven's siren song based on how overarchingly redundant it is otherwise. When the band arrive back at the academy, Kincaid orders Morgan to get checked over at the infirmary, and because Morgan hasn't felt like a victim recently, she decides to voice her intentions to go against his order just to piss him off. And just like clockwork, Kincaid throws a fit about it, and makes her go on threat of leaving her out of the next hunt. In the infirmary, the other hunters take their shirts off to get checked over in the examination room, which, to the absolute delight of Morgan, seemingly doesn't have a door. But when it comes to her turn, she starts taking issue, the obvious reasons being that she's a girl and there's no door, but also because she's trying to keep her runes private. So, we're kind of at an impasse. How is it resolved? By the nurse immediately giving up and letting her go without properly checking her over. Hooray for writing yourself into a corner. On to the next day, Kincaid has lined up a practical exercise. The students run while the teachers hunt. The goal for the students is to be the last one caught. But Morgan decides it's a peasant's game, so slips away and begins trying to solve that mystery she remembers she has to do. She makes her way through the three door rooms of the witches who are killed, and finds the evidence was cleaned up with primordial magic. Morgan has so much fun playing detective that she wants to do it longer. She tries to sniff out the teachers and work out a long term solution to avoid them. Oops, she's in their dorm room. 
bathroom, how embarrassing. After she snoops around for a bit, then gets bored and wanders out, Atlas spots her and tries to chase her down. But she turns a corner and bumps into Ryder's wolf form, standing around, doing nothing, because he had oh so conveniently decided that his job as a teacher and role as a hunter in this exercise wasn't worth his time. And Atlas gets carried off by an enormous golden dragon. Probably. I mean, the author never tells us where he went, so... Ryder shifts into a human again, clothing himself from a communal dresser, and starts a monologue about how hard it is being a werewolf in this world and how he's got this super moving sob story about killing his father which probably would have interested me if it were at all prefaced, interesting, explanatory or mentioned ever again. Kitchen Knife arrives to be a walking case in point, not for the father thing, the being oppressed thing, using her magic to force Ryder to stand still so she can play with him. Morgan holds Ryder's hand and uses her talk to dispel her curse, allowing them both to leave and Ryder to whine even more about being oppressed. Morgan leaves Ryder to go to the Academy Morgue where the witch's bodies are kept. Yeah, the Academy has a morgue. I don't know what- oh, this has happened before. There she realizes the exact same thing she did when she looked at the case file. All the markings on their bodies are similar to hers, only now it's framed as a plot thickening shock, so you have my permission to gasp. Morgan switches gears from trying to work out who killed the witches to trying to work out her past. She goes to the library and tries to find out more about her runes. This is where Draven finds her, who'd also decided to give up on the hunt and still managed to find Morgan before the hunters remaining who are actually making an effort. Morgan decided Draven was far too handsome to be the killer, so shows him her runes and talks about the murders she's trying to solve in the middle of the library. But before she can give away enough to indicate she has any idea what she's actually doing, a longhorn blares, signalling an emergency. The beef chops and Morgan arrive at the headmistress's office. Kincaid rightfully tells Morgan that she's a student and this matter is none of her business, but the headmistress invites her to listen anyway, and Kincaid gets angry at Morgan for this. You know, for the drama. Morgan, Kincaid and the headmistress are in her office while the others wait outside. Hey, why can't they listen in as well? Don't they need to be in the loop? Wait, where are you going? Where is she going? This is supposed to be an emergency! Ryder, chase her down and get her back here! <sighs> the headmistress's ill-explained departure allows Morgan to immediately tell Kincaid about the murder she's trying to solve as well. Wasn't this supposed to be confidential? Morgan continues that he should leave her alone to solve the mysteries in peace, and Kincaid, finding the idea of not having an emotional stranglehold on his favourite student existentially terrifying, responds by kissing her. Oh no, this isn't problematic at all, because you see, he's really handsome, and she actually likes it, so... This is not okay, Stacy. This... Bloody f***ing glucks. They go back to arguing pretty quickly, but Kincaid seems to have forgotten what it was about because he almost completely agrees on Morgan's terms before... Oh, she's back. Where the hell did you go? You called for this emergency meeting, why hold all of us up? Whatever, whatever, go, go, go! What's the emergency? She tells Morgan that being mildly sexually assaulted is no excuse for not working with Kincaid. Why do we have time for this? And hammers home a decision by suffocating her when she object. No! Your coven's being attacked by an army of primordial creatures. Go! Go! Why did you make such a grievance out of that? Ugh. Another review I have argon. When we do the author's job for her and cut out the fat, we find ourselves... I'm sorry, what part of Go did you not understand? What? Really? What the f***? Why? For what reason? So apparently Stacy's idea of an emergency is 20 minutes looking at maps and acting like they can, for the life of them, actually plan anything! And it's at the start of the chapter, so I can't just skip ahead. I don't know how you put up with your own writing, Stacy. So I guess I have 20 minutes to film? Uh, I have a very bad idea, and it's gonna take a hot minute, so... Hold tight for a second while I just... While I just... <laughs> Ah, that should- ah, ah, ah. Oh, oh, I see what's happened. What? Uh, who, who are you? Doesn't matter right now, you'll figure it out soon enough. Now, if you want to fix this, come closer. Oh, uh, oh, uh, okay. Ah! You'll never do something stupid like that again. Okay, you didn't need to hit me. You've already done another <sighs> stupid thing, so you deserved it. What did I do? In due time, t just take this and show me your book. You're not gonna hit me with it, are you? What the glucks? Wow. 
Right, we're finally here. Who's ready to- oh. Oh, wow, that is a literal bloodbath. Were there even that many people living here? Ugh. Finally on the other side of the portal, Morgan suffers from a bout of- Nope. That's- that's it! I'm going to kill her! Where is she? Oh, that's right. Morgan jumps through the portal first, but comes out last with a severe bout of vertigo, because something something primordial magic. It's never explained why, but what else is new? Kinkei tries to use this as an excuse to leave Morgan out of the rescue mission. Morgan objects, and Kinkei then threatens to sneak away and leave her behind with all the people he was sent to save. You know the preeminent reason he's there at all? Anyway, Morgan has an argument about that and inevitably wins, so... They make tracks towards the portal and have to fight off a small gathering of people. Morgan takes them on with the knowledge that the enemy's weakness is its head, which is something no one else seems to know, so their attempts to participate just have them floundering around and getting stabbed a lot. During the fight, Morgan hears the noise of someone else fighting off in the distance. Chasing it down, she finds... Asher. Yeah. Remember him? The one thing Stacy did right? For an author that flirts with the worst outcome to everything, Stacy sure has an allergic aversion to actions having consequences. They also find McGregor, who isn't important at all in the remaining story, so there's really no reason at all for... Ring, hold on, I gotta take this, hello? As I was saying, McGregor was never found after the attack, though he's suspected to be the unidentified bloated corpse found dropped down a well five weeks from now. After the battle is over, Morgan approaches the severely injured Asher and the meat pies are like, No! Don't do that! Hellhounds are bad! Morgan is like, F*** off, Asher's my friend. And they're like, uh, but, uh, but Hellhounds are bad! Morgan ignores them, but the author doesn't, taking the liberty of turning Asher into a handsome straight male with washboard abs. Yay! Can't get enough of those. The Sausage Crew plus one decides to bring the survivors back to the academy and leave the relief team to take on closing the portal. They return to the coven, and an enormous golden dragon opens the portal back. But before she's done, the portal opens to another destination, one where someone is waiting for Morgan on the other side. This person is Morgan's cousin, Ethan. And you can tell he's her cousin because he's the only handsome dude in this entire fucking book that doesn't leave her in a puddle of hormones. He pleads with Morgan to go through the new portal he set up and let him save her. And by save her, he means make her go against everything she's lived and trained for in the nine or so years of life she remembers and take over the only Earth she currently knows. And not really save her at all, but and instead make her do all the work for him on the justification of that's just what family does for each other. Morgan rejects his kind offer after two of her boyfriends threaten to kill themselves. Seeing this, Ethan gets insecure, drops his act, and starts threatening Morgan in a dire attempt to show that he's so evil. Much more evil than a boyfriend's. The portal redirects to the academy again, and Morgan again attempts to get her and Asha through. Kitchen Knife, the original one this time, takes issue with that. Oh, Glux. And Morgan being Morgan, she takes it like a child and cries to her boyfriend about- Oh, no, actually, she just breaks her nose and hops on through anyway. How uncharacteristically proactive. Where has this Morgan been this whole time? You could swap this mirror out for a threatening note, or a black market ledger, or a bag of mind control drugs, and it wouldn't make a difference. More on that later, when the hunters reveal the info they're deliberately hiding for the purposes of later plot twists. What? Don't read, not this part? Oh, okay, sorry. Because being spied on by a womanizing arsehat is just so sodding dreamy! The poor cries tell her that's a stupid idea, but she has an argument about it and wins, so... And Morgan being Morgan, she rushes to Asher without worrying about any traps or noise and triggers an alarm. Morgan, Morgan, Morgan! So I guess all the talk he did about fighting the enemy to the death, no matter what, was there because it sounded cool, right? 